Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Hannah Cox, who is a minimalist, adventurer and creator. Hannah has travelled extensively all over the world and in March 2017 she left the UK with her partner Phil to travel overland through 18 countries to reach Bhutan. This expedition was called The Road to Happiness. Hi Hannah, how are you? I'm good, thank you Sarah. So Hannah, where, where are you based at the moment? I'm back in Manchester. I've been based in Manchester since 2011. Um, And actually, when we went away on our trip, we had no idea whether we were coming back or not. But obviously, we have. Uh, We came back to Manchester in March. And we're planning to be settled here for the next couple of years uh, in between trips. So I first heard you speak, actually, at um, Yes Stories down in London, and it was, unfortunately, you only get 15 minutes to share your story. And I think everyone was just like, oh, my goodness. It was like, you need to carry on talking for so much longer. So it's such a pleasure to get you on the podcast. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing like a double episode, which is going to be excellent. So we're going to talk about your 18,000 mile adventure, the road to happiness. And then in the second episode, we're going to be talking all about money because you were £20,000 worth in debt. So super excited to just be discussing all of that. But Hannah, how would you introduce yourself? You know, Yeah, tell people a little bit more about you. Well, I'm 34 years old. I, I describe myself on my blog as a minimalist adventurer, which means I don't have a lot of things and I like going on adventures, essentially. Um, I've been had the travel bug since I was about 19, 20 years old. Um, and I've always tried to incorporate that in my life. And I think now I'm in my 30s, I just thought, right, this is the time I'm really going to commit myself to making a life that's based around adventure. And part of that was the last trip that I've been on, the, the Road to Happiness expedition. So tell us more about the Road to Happiness. How did it all come about? Where did the idea come from? Uh, well, like I said, I've got a blog uh, and on it, I write about um, well-being, um, happiness, like work and travel. Um, and I, also, I think a lot of those things are interlinked. And I ran a meetup group in Manchester and I used to run a Saturday morning coffee um, event where you could come and plan your adventures. And I would just help people put in to place like the first few steps they needed to plan their own trips away. And I was asked what my next trip was. And I'd recently read an article about how teenagers in the UK were really depressed and really finding it difficult to uh, be positive about the future. And I started reading happiness reports. And I found out that Denmark was um, the happiest place on earth, according to the 2016 World Happiness Report. And then I also read about how Bhutan measures everything, the government measures everything by gross national happiness. I thought, how interesting would it be to visit both those countries and see if, as an outsider, that's reflected in how people are in their day-to-day lives? So I thought, well, I can make that an adventure. I could travel to Denmark and to Bhutan. And then it just kind of, the whole idea was essentially just grew. And it grew from travelling to Denmark and then travelling to Bhutan, but doing the entire trip overland. And then right when I was kind of getting to booking everything I was going to book my flight to Copenhagen to be like well I've done my first kind of booking of the trip and then I thought well why wouldn't I just start in the UK and do that from overland too so yeah so I just essentially held myself accountable with my group said yeah I'm doing I'm doing this trip UK to Bhutan it's going to be amazing but at that point I had like zero plan of how that was going to happen I had no money no idea about visas how long it was going to take me anything like that it was simply kind of that initial idea and saying that I was doing it do you know what I think is really interesting there is the fact that well there's two things it's one it's having the idea which obviously sort of excites you you start researching and you know like sort of happiness and finding out the countries and then it's the second part where it's it's the accountability you started to tell people but at the same time you didn't you know you had no money you didn't understand like visas how it was all going to you know how you were going to make it happen now generally I think from probably what you've experienced from working with your adventure group and for, for me is a lot of people will 
have the idea and then they'll get hugely overwhelmed and think, well, how, you know, how am I going to make this happen? I, I don't have, you know, I don't have the resources. I don't, I don't know where to even start. Where did you start? Like what, what was your method? Well, it was, it was not um, very technical. I had a big map of the world on my wall above my computer. And I have that there as kind of a motivational tool anyway. And I just kind of drew a line through some countries and thought, well, that's, that would make the most sense to go that way. And then I contacted a couple of visa agencies. There's a company called the Visa Machine, um, who were really good at helping um, individuals put together visas for trips. And the original plan was to go kind of through Turkey and through the stands. And at the time, a lot of that was subject to change of where you were able to pass and where you weren't able to pass. And I was very concerned I was going to plan a trip where by the time I got to um, kind of Turkey and Iran, that I would have trouble getting through borders. Um, so then I kind of flipped that round and I'd always wanted to go on the Trans-Siberian Railway. So I thought, right, well, I'll just kind of go a really convoluted way to help. Them, and I will go through Russia, Mongolia and China and then through Southeast Asia that way. And also my original trip, was to go by my car and I had this kind of brilliant idea how I was going to like drive the whole way and it was going to be amazing and people were going to jump in the car with me and I mean bearing in mind I got back in January I still don't have a UK driving license so that <laughs> that idea didn't happen it was way too expensive to even get the car from country to country you have there are fees that have to be paid so it, it the idea originally was to drive and to drive kind of down through Turkey and that way um but yeah it ended up completely changing there was no driving involved we went through Russia instead and also I ended up going with my partner Phil who was not even in the picture when the journey was planned but once I had made that original idea to go away I met Phil about two or three weeks later and he we were talking and I said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm doing this trip because I just kept saying to myself, if I just keep telling people that's what I'm doing, it will happen. And when I meet people for the first time, they will know me as someone that's doing that rather than one of my friends who thinks it's just another one of my silly ideas. Um, so what, yeah, what ended up happening was I said, oh, that's amazing. Um, that sounds like an incredible trip. I'd love to do something like that. And um one of our first conversations was me saying to him, well, you know, you can come if you want. <laughs> and he said, are you serious? I said, yeah. So kind of for the year, 18 months before we went away, our entire relationship, which was, you know, we're, we're partners, we're, we're going out with each other. Um, but our entire relationship was towards this goal that we were about to go on this huge 10 month overland adventure together. So, yeah, it completely changed from the original idea. <laughs> Do you know what? That's okay, though, because I think sometimes you've got to be flexible with with the method. I mean, your, your idea was still the same to get to visit Denmark and to get to go and visit Bhutan. But how you were going to do it, you know, you weren't set in stone. I love the fact that you wanted to drive and like didn't have a driving license. And also how, <laughs> how, how intense as well. I'm just thinking, God, like second or third date. Yeah, let's let's start planning a 10, 10 month um, on the road, on the road adventure. You had 18 months to plan. And are you, are you, do you draw mind maps? Do you do to-do lists? Are you like old school with writing everything down? Are you, do you use Excel, spreadsheets? I mean, how are you doing your research? Like, I think, because I think that's really fascinating to try and figure out how to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's something I'm always interested in reading about, um, how other people do it. Um, I had a bit of a head injury um, back in 2012 uh, while I was in Laos. I had a bike crash and it wasn't until I came back to the UK that um, I visited my doctors and I realised I'd actually had an issue with my short-term memory, mostly because there was people in Manchester that were coming up and saying hello to me and I had no idea who they were. So since then I have I've got, had to put all these systems in place to remember things. And within my kind of close friends and family, they know that even if we have a conversation, if I haven't written it down on a piece of paper or they haven't sent it in a text message, I'm very liable to forget that we've had that conversation. So I'm very manual in it. I write down a to-do list. I also use, there's a project management software called Trello, which I find really helpful to kind, and I use that as a kind of mind mapping um, process as well. 
Um, and as well as that, I use Evernote, uh, which I've kind of put down any thoughts uh, throughout the day. I use Evernote, which also links to Trello as well. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of a, a, a mix of different things, but they all work together. So I couldn't just just use Trello. I couldn't just have a to do list. Um, I, I also have use Excel to put together kind of monthly and yearly goals and kind of map stuff out that way. So we use kind of a, a multidisciplined way of doing things. And maybe for other people that might seem that I'm doing things five times when I could just do it once. But I find to map things out for me in my head, that's the easiest way in which to do it. And, and to be honest, there is no right or wrong way of doing it. It's finding out exactly like you said, what's going to work for you. When did you know your start date? Because I think it's very important to have that deadline date so that you know that what you're working towards, it's not just this goal in the future. At some point in the future, we're, we're going to head down this road to happiness. When did you know the date? We knew the date around, I think it was around six months before we went. We originally had planned to leave a few months earlier, but we had some family stuff happen, which delayed us leaving the UK. And we didn't actually plan a lot of our trip in advance. There were certain areas which we needed to know when we were going to be there because we needed to apply for visas in advance. So that was Russia and China we needed to do that for. So we kind of just started to work backwards, really. How long did we think we were going to be away for? How much money did we think we were going to need? So then we kind of worked out we could leave in March. So we booked our ferry. Essentially, we booked our ferry over to Amsterdam, our first couple of nights in Amsterdam, and then booked in our visas. And yeah, that was it. What was it like in the run up to leaving? It was obviously super exciting because there's nothing more exciting, I'm sure, for anybody that's planned anything from, you know, a weekend away to backpacking or like a big expedition. There's this definite imposter syndrome, no matter how many times you do it, that it's not going to happen. And I think having Phil by my side, certainly for me, was just incredible because I had this person who genuinely believed I was going to do it and I was thinking well I don't know if I'm actually going to be able to achieve this but I've told you I am and that's how he knew me as someone that was doing this trip so that was it was great to kind of have that confidence around me but I think you just pull together a trip and it's I don't think it's till you're even on it that you're really kind of aware that oh well I've actually achieved this and we in fact Phil's parents live an hour away from the nearest train station in Suffolk and we actually because of kind of all the farewells and everything when we got to the train station we missed our first train so we were like right this is ridiculous it's first first day of the trip we've managed to miss the first train this is not boding well for the rest of the trip we just sat in the pub and had a pint and waited for the next train and everything was absolutely fine but yeah once we were on the ferry to Amsterdam we were like yeah we're doing it it's brilliant and there was no kind of concern after being on that ferry that we weren't going to achieve what, what we set out to achieve. So you mentioned before that you are you, you're a minimalist, so you don't have a lot of stuff. But how do you even pack for this? Were you taking? I mean, I'm I'm imagining a backpack. How did you decide what you were going to take? How did you narrow it down? Was there any key piece of equipment that was you know that were a must for you? Yep. Yeah, so I have chronic back pain. Currently, I now I now wear a permanent back brace. Before we went on the trip, I hadn't had the brace fitted. I was just using an occasional walking stick so part of what we were carrying it was also very important that it wasn't too much because I was going to have to carry it every day Phil wasn't going to be able to carry everything we'd also discussed the idea of making the trip into a film so Phil had bought a lot of camera equipment with him that again we, we could have a discussion about how your trip changes because after about two or three months Phil decided that that wasn't going to be the way that we were going to go. So we actually decided to ditch off filming it full time. And we did just instead make a few short videos because, as you know from doing your Appalachian Trail vlogs, it's a lot of time <laughs> to invest in your trip, just even documenting your trip. So we, we did have to think about how we were going to do that differently. So aside from that, which Phil was carrying anyway, I just had a 45-litre carry-on backpack, which meant it was super small. I had in it essentially I had my own camera a computer because I did have to work while I was away and a minimal amount of clothing and actually throughout the trip 
depending on the climate of where we were, I did ditch clothing and buy new clothing as and when. So the bag that I left was with was certainly not the bag that I came back with. But yeah, it was a very small 45 litre bag. I left a medium sized suitcase in the UK, which contained kind of important documents and a few kind of sentimental items I didn't want to get rid of. But apart from that, actually everything else I owned, uh, I had a two bedroom house in Manchester b- before we left. Everything else I owned, I gave away or sold. So actually, when we went away on the trip, I was essentially carrying everything I owned on my back, apart from this kind of small suitcase that lived at my mum's in the loft while we were away. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but but let's get on to, to the trip and the adventure. And obviously you wanted, you talked about documenting it, whether filming it. Were you sort of blogging as you went and sharing on social media? Was was that a thing back then? Yeah, definitely. So I had my, I've got my small blog, Better Not Stops. I was posting about it on our social media. Phil did a weekly blog update, which went on the website as well. So people were able to follow along, which we also sent out in a newsletter. Like I said, Phil did um, film the beginning of the trip and I did film parts of the trip it does take up a lot of time doing that and what was quite important for us was as much as we wanted to document the trip we also wanted to be within the trip I think it would have been a really hard slog if we'd spent 10 months documenting constantly so yeah we had a blog I documented it on social media I also while we were away was taking notes uh, interviewing a lot of people while we were away for my book so I've actually started a book. It's going to be a three three parter just because it's such a huge undertaking, and I'm going to kind of have it so it's the European part of the trip, the kind of Central and Southeast Asian part of the trip, and then the Indian and Bhutan part of the trip, kind of a separate travel books. Because there's kind of so much information within there that I want to share, and I don't want to scrimp on it. I'll take away from any of those parts. So that that in itself is going to be a massive undertaking and I don't think that will be finished for another at least another year and I think that would be unlikely to be finished within that time frame either. Wow that's going to be awesome like super I mean it's an incredible journey that that you've been on an incredible you know expedition like 18,000 miles you know o- overland just absolutely in- inspiring but take us back to, to the beginning talk us through sort of the European leg or the, the bits which stand out for you. For me the big interest in it was the human contact. So the idea of the road of happiness was to document between essentially the UK and Bhutan, how people are, I guess that would be a really generalized way of saying it. As it says on my website, there is global interest in happiness and well being as primary indicators of, of human development. And I wanted to see how different countries, um, their society and their cultures affect how happy people are with within that so for us especially within Europe it was meeting with people and interviewing them and being able to kind of speak to them one-on-one about that so so within Europe we did something called woofing which is when you work on organic farms it's essentially a volunteer role for three to four hours a day and in exchange your accommodation your food paid for Um, and it's kind of all covered and you spend two to three weeks with a family on a farm and you really get to know them and their culture. And it's you're definitely in a position then when you are able to get to know people on a bit of a deeper level and find out more about who they are and what their country is about and things like that. So during the European leg, for us, woofing was an incredible way to meet some really amazing families and really f- kind of get under the skin of the different countries we were meeting. For example, um, we spent loads of time in Denmark. I'm not sure off the top of my head but I think we were like six weeks in Denmark which even now is insane because we were like we were a month in India which is huge and ages away but we spent six weeks in Denmark because we found it's so fascinating just within Denmark we stayed in three different places and people's attitudes political views all completely different in the same way that it is in the UK so trying to document different countries when sometimes we were only staying within a country for two weeks, three weeks, and how people's happiness and well-being is affected by their work and their family life and things like that was quite hard to do. But there was definitely these touch points where I was really learning a lot about 
essentially the differences in different places of what's important to people. We were in some countries and it was very clear family was a really high indicator of whether people were happy or not. In other countries, it seemed that it was their relationships. In other countries, it seemed social status. In other countries, it was very clear it was getting outside, being in the outdoors and just seeing those changes, but also seeing the the same things cropping up in every single country of what people like to do and what made them happy was this lovely feeling that, oh, we are all the same. Because essentially, when it comes down to it, it's the same things that are making us all happy. What does happiness mean to you? Oh, God. that's Well, obviously, that's an incredibly difficult yeah. question. Happiness to me is spending my time doing things that I love. In You at the Yes Tribe talk I did, and I see this huge correlation between time and money because we either spend time making money or doing things and I'll talk about money you know with you another time but for me certainly it's about spending your time doing things that you love and it's never about money because you want to be spending time doing things that you love and it's about your relationships and if you don't have a good relationship with your family it's about the relationship you have with your friends And it's about looking after yourself. So for me, happiness is being able to wake up every day around people that you enjoy spending time with and doing things that you enjoy. And we're not all lucky enough to be able to do that, but it's also appreciating what you have. And I found there was certainly the happiness I found in between rich countries and poor countries. It never really depended on the amount of money people had. It certainly depended on their relationships and their attitude with themselves and their love for themselves. I think there's a lot to be said with loving yourself and being happy with who you are before looking beyond that for other things to make you happy. Were you happy before you went on this trip? Ooh. Yes, I would say I'm definitely a lot happier after the trip. I think I'm a lot more appreciative of what I have. I'm a lot more understanding of the world. I think as someone that travels, one of the many reasons that I do it is because I like I like my ideas and my thoughts to be challenged by other people because people who are born in different countries are going to have different experiences and different outlooks. And I think it's always good to expose yourself to that because you're always going to be learning something from meeting a new person and visiting a new place. I would say that perhaps a lot of my 20s, I wasn't particularly happy. And when I did go away on trips in my 20s, it was an escapism for not being particularly happy with myself and my situation. And I think it's taken me a few years to get to the point where I'm completely happy with myself and quite confident that whatever I set my mind out to do I'm able to do it and yeah so I I would say I am happy now I was happy before I went on the trip because I think I had to be confident and happy in what I was doing was a good idea but certainly part of being on that trip I learned a lot of people are unhappy and there's a lot that can be done to improve that I think just by talking to other people and opening yourself up to new experiences. I mean, I think with big trips as well, it's, you know, at the beginning, it's it's hugely exciting. You're visiting these new countries, meeting new people, having these you know, wonderful conversations. You're learning so much. Did it become tiring or exhausted after a while? Did you get to a point where you, where you had to really reevaluate what you were doing and why you were doing it? Yeah, definitely. I think there was a point in my trip, I had to come back in... Um, we went, at, went away in the March and we came back to the UK in the January, but there was a point in the, in the November where I was back in the UK for three weeks. We kind of took a break from the trip uh, so that I could come back, get some work done in the UK, and then we kind of started off from the same point again. And during that time, I went to an adventure conference and I was meeting all these incredible people who'd done all these incredible trips. And I'm at the time kind of walked in quite confident, like I'm in the middle of this incredible trip and this is what I'm doing. And I was met with quite a few people who were like, well, how how are you doing that? How are you working that out? Kind of quite scientifically asking me about field work. And I was thinking, oh God, am, am I doing it right? Have I taken enough interviews? Have I written enough notes? Have I taken enough pictures? And I think there is this definite anxiety and it's self-imposed rule. So it's I don't even know where it came from. But certainly there was have I have I done the right thing? Have, have I done enough? Is my trip going to achieve what I wanted it to achieve? And it has for me, it has. And I've, I know perhaps I could have taken some more photos and I could have taken more videos and I could have written more notes. 
but I did what was right for for my trip and I'm happy with how it turned out but I think I did okay but it's it's not a definitive thing that, that you can work out I didn't come back and say right yeah I know what happiness is now I can only come at, come at it from my subjective opinion I certainly learned a lot more about happiness it's not one plus one equals two unfortunately it's not a mathematical equation it's an emotional feeling as well so certainly it's been hard to quantify and discuss with people but I like that about I like that about it because I like the fact it opens up discussion with people about what happiness is and travel and different cultures and things like that. It's quite interesting when you said you, you asked yourself the question like am I doing it right and almost having this this anxiety and this fear that you you know you're somehow doing it wrong and I almost just want to reiterate that actually when it comes to like travel and adventures and your own personal expeditions there is no right or wrong way it's like the same as building a blog or building your social media there's, there's just your way and doing what's right for you so carry on tell us a little bit more about the trip you know you obviously started in Europe you spent a long time in Denmark which sounds incredible <laughs> and then you, you carried on through to Russia and China and Mongolia tell us more about that which I mean I know it's incredibly difficult to sort of narrow it down but were there particular moments or memories whether they were funny stories or scary stories or sad stories that that sort of stand out for you? Well I mean I love to travel by train I think it's the most amazing way to travel I know nothing about like train engines or carriages or anything like that I just love the experience of being taken on a train seeing the scenery past the window and kind of being in this state where you don't actually have to be doing anything even though you know the internet exists now and you could be on your phone and checking emails and stuff I find train time for me has always been this kind of really chilled self-care I'm just going to sit and read my book or I'm going to look out the window and I'm just going to be within the moment train travel has always been like that for me it was fantastic that we spent most of our trips on the train. So we travelled through Europe on the train. There was a small part uh, where we had to get a coach because we couldn't get through a place called Belarus um, on a train uh, because we didn't have a Russian visa. And then, yeah, we travelled pretty much yeah across Russia on the Trans-Siberian, which was insane. It was amazing. I could not explain to anybody how incredible that trip is. I'm going to do quite a detailed blog post about that because we actually found out there was a lot cheaper way to do it than the way that we did it. That was one of our biggest expenses on the trip. Um, and then we, so we pretty much travelled from Amsterdam all the way down to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam by the train. And that was incredible just to get to Ho Chi Minh City, meet a friend of ours called Harry, he lives there, and just be like, yeah, we got here on the train. <laughs> like, this is incredible. We could have got the plane, but we got him on the train and that was amazing. That part of the trip was just even getting to Ho Chi Minh City for me was such a big moment. When we got to Cambodia, Cambodia never used to have a train line. And there's 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 now a really short train line from one of the cities to the coast, which didn't exist before. And they're kind of trying to push it as a tourist train. And that just opening up before we arrived and I was able to get this kind of short piece of train line in Cambodia for me was super exciting because it's pretty much through the jungle and it's incredible and the doors are open and you can just sit and watch the incredible scenery go by and I absolutely adored that part of the trip and yeah that, I mean obviously the whole thing was fantastic traveling by trains a great way to meet people we spoke to so many people on the train it's a great way to watch countries grow and develop and when you're crossing the borders you really feel like you're entering a new space and it's a really nice, slow way to travel. Um, like I said, it took us 10 months to get to Bhutan. And in a way, that was, was quite quick to get there. Oh, yeah, so I really enjoyed traveling by train. We did meet a lot of people that way. And also meeting meeting people along the way who now I could easily say they're, they're really good friends and I'm still in touch with. And, and that was incredible, just meeting people from different countries and finding some really good friendships because we were able to have these, these sorts of conversations with them about happiness and well-being and kind of really being able to delve deep with people because you're spending a few days with them and um, get to know people. So for me, as much as I, I love the nature and the scenery and the travel by train, like for me, travel is the people that you meet because that's where you're really kind of learning about yourself and about the places that you're visiting. Tell us more about Bhutan. I mean, I know it's it's like a mountain kingdom. It's almost this mystical place sort of so far away 
but tell us what it was like sort of arriving. You obviously, you know, you spent 10 months on a train traveling through so many different countries and cultures and you you finally sort of arrived at your destination. What was it like crossing crossing over into the country? So it costs like $250 a day per person to be in Bhutan. When we actually left on the trip, Phil said, well, I'm not going to Bhutan. It's I'm not spending a thousand pounds to go to Bhutan at the end of the trip. I just thought, why would you travel all this way not to spend that money to, to do the end of the trip? But I understood it was my vision, my trip. And for him, that just wasn't an important part of it. So I, and I didn't push it, even though I was really upset that he wasn't going to kind of cross that last bit of the trip with me. But I didn't push it. And I'm glad that I didn't, because by the time he kind of got to Southeast Asia, he changed his mind and he did want to come to Bhutan. So I was like, yes, thank goodness. And actually arranging that part of the trip was quite interesting because trying to explain to the travel agencies that we wanted to come in overland, even though that was going to add more, <laughs> an incredible amount of extra money to our journey, because essentially on that first day and last day in Bhutan, we were going to be traveling by car to the border explaining that was like yeah no that's actually really important we have to we have to travel by car and in Bhutan it's different so you you pay this kind of tourist tax and you're given a driver and you're given a tour guide and you're not left alone at any point while you're in the country so we got picked up at the Indian border and driven over by our tour guide and driver who were in Bhutanese dress and you kind of cross through these beautiful gates and you're suddenly, if anyone's been to India, it's crazy, it's chaotic, it's messy. And you just cross this border and it's a, it's a, the land border is basically, it's a town, which is half Bhutanese and half Indian. So, and there's just a gate kind of in between the two. And you just cross over the line and there's no rubbish anywhere and everything's clean and there's no street hawkers and everyone's wearing Bhutanese national dress and it's kind of like being in Disneyland. So that was really weird, really weird, especially after being in India. We got driven. It's really windy road through Bhutan. So it took us about four hours to get to our hotel on these incredibly windy roads. And we got dropped off in our hotel and it had a bath and sofas and this huge double bed with like five deep pillows and tea and coffee making facilities. And we were like, what have we stepped into? And there was this, this incredible overwhelm of one that we got into Bhutan anyway. And we'd kind of got to this place where we were like, wow, this is where we've been heading for for the last 10 months. And then this kind of second feeling of what is this place? Because this is nothing like the Asia that we know. And it was a real, real culture shock being in Bhutan because it was like nowhere I'd ever been before. And we were it felt like we were treated like royalty. Like I said, you're given a driver, you've got a tour guide, you have a specific itinerary that you're you're put on for the time that you're there. And it's an incredibly beautiful country. It's incredibly difficult to explain what it's like being there. There's some beautiful photos on your website. I mean, one, um, one which I think a lot of people would maybe uh, know what it is they were looking at, you know, is these uh, like mountain monasteries which is sort of built yes. on the side of, of the, the mountains, which you know look absolutely incredible. I mean, did you go and visit those? Yes. Yeah, so the Tiger's Nest Monastery, I think that's one of the most famous kind of pictures of Bhutan and, you know, kind of most famous pictures of, you know, the 10 places to see before you die. And that was the last place we visited on our trip. And I was quite nervous about that. I'd had my this was in uh, early January and I'd had my back brace fitted in November, which essentially is like a big hard plastic shell that I wear un like underneath. I wear like a vest. I wear this like back brace and then I kind of put a T-shirt on top. It was quite uncomfortable to wear anyway, but it did make me quite nervous about any hiking that we were doing. And when we got to Bhutan, I said, oh, you know, how do we get to the tiger's nest? And he said, oh, yeah, it's just like a four hour hike up the mountain and then we'll like be at the monastery and then we just hike back down I just had this sinking feeling I thought what if I can't do that but then suddenly the entire trip for me kind of came into this small day of if I don't manage to get to this monastery my trip will have completely fallen apart which again it was a stupid self-imposed decision that I put on myself so the day that we went to view the monastery I kind of got ready had my walking stick 
um, which we'd been traveling with anyway. And I thought, right, well, you know, I'll just take it one step at a time, take take a couple of um, ibuprofen before we go and we'll be fine. And we, d- we did the walk and about two hours kind of up the hill, there's a cafe. So we kind of stopped and kind of had a drink. You can see the Tiger's Nest Monastery from the cafe and it, it's this incredible view. And I thought, right, yeah, I can do this. And then after the cafe, it's kind of um, more up a hill and then a lots of kind of stairs to, then to get to the monastery. But by this point, I started to lose the feeling in my right leg. I have um, I have this thing where sometimes uh, the nerves get trapped in my kind of hip bones and I, I lose the feelings in my in my legs, which sounds scarier than it is because it happens to me quite a lot. So I think I'm quite used to it now. But I, anyway, I started to lose the feeling in my right leg and I thought, I can't tell Phil because he's obviously going to think we should go back down. So I just kind of kept, I'm quite a determined person. So I just kept plugging on essentially. And we got to the, got to the monastery and you have to like take your shoes off and you're not allowed to take your bag or anything in with you. So we sat down and we were kind of sorting our things out. And when we went to get back up, I couldn't get back up. And I remember just Phil turning around to me and saying, oh, are you like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, but I mean, I just can't feel my leg. And he looked at me with this face of typical you. I knew you wouldn't tell me if there was a problem. So he kind of carried me around looking around the monastery and I kind of worked out whatever it was in my leg at that point and it, and it felt okay. And then and we, we walked back and we stopped in the cafe on the, on the way back, um, on the way back down. And I was feeling fine again. Uh, but it was quite funny because we were in this cafe and there was – we left quite early in the morning to kind of avoid the crowds. I think we left about 7 a.m. We'd, we'd started our trek up there. So on our way back, there were kind of people who were still on their way there. And there were these huge groups of um, huge groups of American tourists and Indian tourists. And we spoke to quite a few of them on the walk and also in, in the cafe on the way there, on the way back. And quite a few people were like, oh, yeah, well, I'm just going to. I can see it from here, so I'm just going to look at it from here and then just go back down. And I was like, what? How could you? You've travelled all this way. You ha- I know you're spending a lot of money to be here because you have to spend a lot of money to be in Bhutan. And why would you not kind of go a little bit further <laughs> to see something which is an incredible wonder of the world? But I guess some people have different views. They were happy to just kind of sit in the cafe and take a picture um, and just, just not go up there and experience it. But I'm really happy I pushed myself to do it because it was one of the most beautiful, incredible places I've ever seen in my life. And you can't take your camera in. You know, you just go in there and you kind of look at it and experience it and just marvel at how anybody built something so beautiful up on a mountain in Bhutan. It was quite funny to, one, have this kind of cafe on the way in which, you know, you were meeting other people. And two, it being for the people who just couldn't be bothered to walk the last the last couple of you know couple of hours to go and see it It yeah it was funny you finished your trip there in Bhutan you saw this incredible monastery you did complete the walk even with a numb leg (laughs) what do you think you learned most about that experience I think on a personal level I certainly learned that happiness is number one something to be found within yourself if you're not if you're not personally happy happy with who you are as a person you're going to really struggle to find happiness in life I've met people who just had the kindest nicest gentlest souls and pretty much everybody who I met who seemed to be very happy in who they were as a person was very happy to help us out as a couple help me out individually just you know in general just being kind people and there's just was a lot of kindness I found and Something my mum always said to me was, if you don't ask, you don't get. And the worst thing somebody's going to say to you is, no, I can't help you out. So we definitely learn how to ask people for help and also understand if people weren't able to help us, but also accept help when it was offered. And we had some really lovely experiences from doing that. Yeah, from a personal level, it was realising that the most important thing was to be kind and that if I didn't achieve anything else in my life, if it was that people would meet me and think that I was kind and know that they could ask me for help and that even if I couldn't help, I would try and find a way to help them. Um, that would be a really nice legacy that I would like to leave. That's lovely. And I know you've got um, <laughs> your, your other business is like tattooing and you've got like a number of tattoos yourself. 
did you get a tattoo to like commemorate your trip or did you get any tattoos afterwards or during my other job is I sell artwork by tattoo artists I can't actually um, tattoo myself I did have this kind of idea that every country I went to I'd get a new tattoo um, and Phil completely vetoed that as an idea simply because and, and not from that he tells me what to do with my body at all but simply because I have an incredible um, ability to get sick and and to get ill and We'd been away the year before to Portugal for three weeks and I'd had a tattoo just before I went away and I'd somehow I managed to get it infected and he was just like, I just, and then before we went on this trip, I cut my leg shaving, which at 33, I can't believe I still do, but I'd cut my leg shaving and I had to, and that got infected. So I had to take antibiotics for that. So Phil just had this vision if, if I got a tattoo that my arm would fall off. So that was vetoed. However, um, while we were on the trip, unfortunately, it was during the time there was the Manchester Arena bombings and our shop in Manchester is right next to the arena. And I really felt that I wanted something to commemorate that. And a lot of tattoo artists in Manchester were tattooing bees on people as kind of a way to raise money for charity and a way to kind of show solidarity with people who were affected by that. Our shop, we sold like a limited edition print to raise money and we raised around a thousand pounds for charity. And I also went and found a tattooist in, uh, where was I, in Estonia. And I had kind of a, a bee tattoo on my arm while we were away. Apart from that, no, I didn't get tattooed anywhere else. I did want to, but I kind of never really decided what I was after. I think it's likely that I will get something done after the trip but I'd quite like to go back to, to India and perhaps get something done while I'm out in India and that's a plan for next year so yeah a map of the world with your journey yeah. tattooed <laughs> on your back yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh amazing Hannah now you have actually mentioned your blog but just have the um where your blog is what sort of information that they can find on it and why they should go and visit okay so my blog is called better not stop all one word um, essentially that comes to a conversation I had with my dad just before he passed away. He was, he had pancreatic cancer and died quite quickly and was in a hospice for his last few weeks. And one of the things he told me was to never settle in my life on what I was doing because unfortunately he, he died just after his 60th birthday and he just retired and he'd always had all these huge plans of what he was going to do during his retirement retirement and how he was going to spend his time and he worked you know a full-time job all the hours under the sun until then for somebody else and he kind of had all these ideas of what he was going to do and then unfortunately his health deteriorated and he wasn't able to do any of them so it really for me better not stop symbolizes this thought that there is no better time than today to take control of how you're spending your life and how you're spending your time for me personally that's through travel through adventure through running my own business um, through spending time with my family and my friends so my blog is we've got the weekly blog posts from our trip to Bhutan they're all on there um, and it's going to be populated with like travel tips travel tips for the time we were away and then I also have a lot of, of stuff on there about my lifestyle so I talk about minimalism I talk about money talk about well-being I talk about work and something that I've recently started doing which will be live when this podcast comes out is I'm starting to do monthly income reports because certainly in the world of adventure I think money seems to be a dirty word and people don't really like talking about it and how much money they're earning and I think I'd like to show how I'm living my lifestyle and then for other people to see if it's something they might want to do too show them some kind of practical tips and advice that I'm doing see if it will help them yeah absolutely fantastic Hannah and actually that's obviously that's what we're going to be discussing in the next episode which will be coming out on Thursday so it's like a double double episode of Tough Girl this week because we are going to be discussing all about money how you got out of £20,000 worth of debt what what you were doing so basically how you've earned it how you've spent it and you know top tips and advice which will be absolutely fantastic but Hannah thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about your incredible journey the, the road to happiness 18,000 mile adventure absolutely inspiring thank you so much thank you hey 
Hey tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Hannah Cox. What an incredible journey. Now, as we mentioned at the very start, we're doing something quite special with Hannah because there was definitely two parts to this story, but I didn't really want to rush it and I didn't want to just try and cram everything into about 45 minutes. So we've actually broke it down into two sections. So the first section, which you've just listened to, is obviously all about the adventure, the road to happiness, traveling over land. But the beginning of the story is equally is just as important. Hannah was £20,000 worth in debt and we wanted to talk more about the money side of things. So how A, how she got out of that debt and B, how she saved for her next adventure. Because there is this definite world of secrecy, I would say, about money and funding and how people afford to go and travel, afford to go on adventures. And these are legitimate reasons, but they're also legitimate excuses of reasons why not to do something. So in the next episode with Hannah, which is coming out this Thursday on Tough Girl Extra, we're going to be talking all about the money side of things. Um, There's going to be practical tips and advice, what Hannah's learned along the way, and how she ended up saving £15,000 to go on this journey. I also share more about my journey of trying to earn an income from Tough Girl Challenges, which if you've been listening to the podcast will know it has not been easy. And I think that's one of the things I definitely wanted to portray, that it is not all sunshine and roses and that you you can't just wake up one day and say, yes, I'm going to go off and be an adventurer and travel the world and people are going to fund my amazing adventures. It doesn't work like that. But what has been life changing for me, and we'll talk about Patreon as well in more detail on the next episode, is, is Patreon. This incredible resource which was only set up about three or four years ago which is all about helping creators so when creators produce content such as vlogs blogs podcasts etc they can actually get paid for their work so at the moment you know blogs and podcasts and vlogs are all free to watch and yes you can make money through adsense but really you can't really make a huge a lot until you've got millions and millions and millions of subscribers but through patreon you can actually start to fund the running cost and the living cost of hosting the website hosting a podcast, etc. And Patreon for me has been absolutely life changing. I remember when I was going into debt every single month for putting out content, but it was, you know, the Tough Girl podcast is something I'm so hugely passionate and excited about that I did do it for two years without making any money. But I was in the very fortunate situation to be at home living with my parents while I had the time to build up the business, um, build up the content and and give myself this breathing space to, to make it work and for it to be able to earn myself um, an income from doing what I love and from following my passion. But if you want to learn more about becoming a patron because I couldn't do this without the support of these individual patrons of you guys who are out there supporting me every single month with five dollars a month ten dollars a month fifteen dollars a month twenty five dollars a month it makes such a big difference knowing that at the beginning of every month I know how much income I'm going to have coming in, um, how much therefore I can then budget for the month ahead and what I need to spend those funds on. And that also includes saving up for the next challenge, next adventure, and also moving out of home, which I will be doing at the end of August. So you've probably heard me talk about this, but more information will come. But beginning of September, I'll, I will have finished my dissertation for my master's and it will be time to move on. And uh, yeah, I've got uh, some exciting challenges and adventures planned, which I can't wait to share with you all. But for more information about me, what I'm up to, and if you are new to the podcast, please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com, which is where you can find all of the information you could possibly need, information about the incredible women that we've had on the podcast. There's over 160 of them now, huge amount of variety, well worth checking out. There's regular blog posts which come out on Friday, which gives you tips and advice taken from podcast episodes. So it's listening to the podcast episode and taking out the key key piece of information and that's a great resource we do have the tough girl tribe as well which is only open to the female patrons to come and join the tough girl tribe anyway enough from me but make sure you subscribe the next episode is coming out on thursday where we do talk all about money (laughs) 